right now on Five on Your Side at 10. An ongoing problem. It's like a racetrack. I almost hear cars speeding by every day, you know, daily. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. An exclusive look at the crash that put one construction worker in the hospital and left another dead. Parking problems plaguing the Metro. Crooks scamming unsuspecting Cardinals fans. Tips to save you from getting a ticket. Breaking March Madness records. What does it mean to Edwardsville? Uh, she's our hometown hero. A look at the local player whose game reached millions. But first, clear skies and light winds will make for a frosty start to the weekend. The weather first weather alert that may have you out covering some of your plants before bed tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kelly Jackson. Jack Frost is making a brief comeback tonight. We are in a weather alert as an unseasonal freeze makes its way through the by state by tomorrow morning. We have Chief Meteorologist Scott Connell with the first look at our weather forecast. And will the overnight frost throw a little wrench in our springtime gardening, Scott? For most of us, no, but it's one of those things where, especially east of St. Louis, temperatures may flirt with freezing once again early tomorrow morning. We're nowhere close to that right now, but last night, similar situation in areas west of St. Louis dropped into the upper 20s around 30. Even some parts of the metro saw some frost this morning. And now that the clouds are clearing up off to our east, we do expect to see some of those colder temperatures building in. So we have freeze warnings in effect for areas east of St. Louis in Illinois. 28, 29, 30 degrees along the Interstate 57 corridor out Interstate 70. Get back into the metro area, probably not dropping below freezing, but we'll likely see temperatures that slide back into the mid 30s. And with the winds becoming light, that is enough to create frost for early tomorrow morning, which means if you have some tender plants, especially in those areas off to the east of St. Louis, say like hostas here that have already come up and started budding out, you might want to cover those, especially Especially if you've planted something recently, mainly annuals and those summer vegetables, it's still a little early. We usually say wait till tax day and if you really want to be safe, wait till Mother's Day. But if you do have something that's newly planted or that is susceptible to freeze damage, then you want to use some cloth, paper or uh, maybe some fabric to kind of cover that for the overnight hours, protect those plants. And then you can take that off tomorrow morning and hopefully that'll be the last of it for this year. We'll talk more on the eclipse in a few minutes, Kelly. All right, Scott. Tonight, a construction worker is dead. His co-worker is in the hospital. Police say both were hurt after a driver crashed into their work zone today in South St. Louis County. It happened this morning near the intersection of South Broadway and Ripa Avenue. Robert Townsend has exclusive details you will only see on Five in Your Side, including an interview with the victim's boss. Marvin Rudloff says around 9 Friday morning, his six-member crew from Glenlow Awning and Window Company in Imperial was installing a new awning on this resale shop in South St. Louis County. He says one hour on the job, the unthinkable happened. It would happen so fast. Witnesses and neighbors say out of the blue, a driver in a light-colored Cadillac sped around this curve down South Broadway, left the road, and crashed into the workers. It's devastating. We're a family business. Rudloff says his 35-year-old employee, Chris Johnson, was handing his co-worker, Carl Cease, materials when Johnson got pinned under a truck and was killed. Johnson lived in House Springs and had a seven-year-old son. All these guys are like brothers, all these six guys that work together every day, um, and now... They're all missing their brother. 59-year-old Carl sees a husband and grandfather from Arnold, suffered injuries when he flipped off a ladder. They're awaiting uh, MRI uh, scan on him. Uh, he's got stitches on the back of his head. He's, uh, they're checking to see if he's had any uh, broke ribs. Witnesses told police the Cadillac driver may have been drag racing with a driver in a gray Acura before the deadly crash. There's a sign posted clearly showing the speed limit on Broadway is 40 miles an hour. Like a racetrack. I almost hear cars speeding by every day. Neighbor James Finkland says he shared this video of the speeding Cadillac and Acura with police. I feel bad, you know, it's just, you know, it's just, it's, 
people just drive through here like they, they like they don't care. Witnesses say after the crash, the Cadillac driver hopped out of his car, ran, and apparently tried to get on a bus. The workers and several witnesses surrounded him until police got here. All my guys are in shock and devastated. This isn't supposed to happen when you come to work. Robert Townsend, five of your side. And the driver of the Cadillac is now out of the hospital and in police custody. The owner of the resale shop says earlier this year, another driver slammed into his business and left the scene. Police are still investigating today's crash. Today, police confiscated a gun from an East Alton Wood River High School student just as classes were about to start. A security officer at the school was told the student had a gun on school property. The officer confronted the student and took the weapon. No one was harmed or threatened, and the student was taken off campus. No other details have been released. A South St. Louis bar caught fire this afternoon while it was still open. It happened at Stella Blues on Morgan Ford Road at around 1.30. Fire crews reported heavy smoke at the scene. The fire spread from the back of the building to the second floor, which is residential. The brick building suffered major damage, but no one was hurt. A warning if you are parking downtown anytime soon, beware of crooks looking to take your money. Cardinals fans leaving yesterday's home opener returned to find parking tickets on their cars, even though they thought they paid to park. Five in your side's Brent Solomon explains. It's one of the most exciting days of spring in St. Louis. It was our first time coming to opening day. Um, and we, my fam, my whole family came, my four children, my grandchildren, my husband and I. Julie Cuiava traveled from Mount Vernon, Illinois. We were having a hard time finding parking. We happened across this lot uh, where there were like three guys in vests. It was a grassy lot here on Broadway, about a 10 minute walk to Bush Stadium. My son was like, you know, we've been driving around for 30 minutes trying to find parking. We can't find any. So we parked there along with probably about a hundred other cars. I mean, it was, I mean, they were rolling in. They went to the game and had a blast. Afterwards, they returned to a big shock. Every single car in that lot had a ticket. The family was slapped with a $30 fine now due to the city after already handing over $40 to what now appears to be a fake parking lot attendant that was right here. There were guys in vest taking money. A city spokesperson shared this with five on your side. All our staff are identified in uniform and their vests state City of St. Louis Parking Division on the back of their vests. If someone is in an ununiformed vest, this is a fraudulent and unauthorized attempt to collect your money. City leaders say grassy lots like these are not meant for parking. They encourage drivers to use city-owned lots and parking garages. There are also private lots, but you have to make sure they're legit. Knowing that what that means to, the, to people in the city and outside of the city to come to opening day at a Cardinals game and then to have you know, 100 cars in the lot where we were parked alone, get parking tickets is just crazy. Brent Solomon, five on your side. And while the city says the parking tickets are justified, officials say they're investigating the incident since there is no permit on record for the location where those cars parked. A historic Iowa women's basketball team is playing against rival UConn to make it to the championship game. And one area player helped make their last match the most watched college basketball game in ESPN history. Five minute size Andy Crawl attended a watch party in Glen Carbon where the Edwardsville native needs no introduction. They've been waiting for this game their whole lives. This is a once in a lifetime situation. I don't think well, I don't think I'll see this again in my coaching career. Former Edwardsville High School coaches and teammates of sixth year Iowa women's basketball captain Kate Martin all with their eyes on Friday's game against UConn at Edley's Barbecue averaging 12.3 million viewers in the Elite Eight March Madness game. I am almost speechless when it comes to this whole thing. You know, I, I text her and I call her family and I'm just like, do you guys know like how how big this is and how this is like little girls dreams come true? It's fun whenever we can be a part of this and obviously having stars like Caitlin that that 
attracts more and more people and it, it's fun to be in the position that we are and be role models. Grateful for the cheers here in Glen Carbon making their way all the way to Cleveland with Kate Martin's parents as they go to cheer on their daughter, battle UConn with one of her best friends and arguably the face of collegiate women's and men's basketball this year, Caitlin Clark. I don't see all the dazzle that comes with this, I think because I'm inside. Caitlin is just a down to earth, good person so it's just another one of Kate's teammates who is every bit as hardworking as Kate. Kate back in 2017 at Edwardsville hitting a quick three as she would eventually do in college to try and beat UConn. All these girls that are in the final four growing up UConn was the team they grew up dreaming about playing on. This is a big game. You either wanted to be on the team, recruited by them. If they didn't, you were upset, right? So this is a big game. There will be chips on these girls' shoulders. Reporting in Glen Carbon, Annie Crawl, five on your side. In an exciting turn of events, Iowa just pulled ahead of UConn. The score in the fourth quarter, Iowa 60, UConn 57. SLU's women's basketball team will be fighting for the WNIT crown tomorrow against Minnesota. Tip off for the Billigans, 2 p.m. Coming up, caught on camera and heading to a landfill. I took the time and effort to, to separate the trash and recycle, and it still wound up in the trash. We investigate a case of recycling gone wrong. The difference between 99 and a total solar eclipse is literally night and day. Countdown to the great American eclipse, where and when you can celebrate this celestial show. We are tracking shower and storm chances for Sunday with the anticipation that we get a great view of the solar eclipse Monday. An updated look at that cloud cover forecast. Tonight, a troubling investigation to the state of recycling in the city of St. Louis. It appears that despite residents' efforts to recycle, much of it is ended up in landfills. Senior investigative reporter Paula Vassan unveils the truth behind recycling in St. Louis. This is recycling gone wrong. It's what Michael Mayer has been filming from his home in the Shaw neighborhood for months. I'm frankly just kind of sad. St. Louis City trash trucks combining trash and recycling, taking everything to the last place this avid recycler wanted to go. Overflowing landfills. I took the time and effort to, to separate the trash and recycle, cleaning out cans, separating cardboard, things like that, and, and yet it still wound up in the trash. He says he is not the only witness. Everybody, when I bring this up, says, oh yeah, I see that happen all the time. So the I-team got answers. Is the city recycling? Absolutely. Talk me through what's happening here. We brought St. Louis City's Refuse Commissioner Randy Breitenfeld this proof showing it's not always the case. And the only way that should be happening is if the foreman gave him permission to do that. He says that's what happened here. To prevent bad recycling from contaminating entire truckloads, certain bins go straight to the trash. Mayor is not convinced there was a targeted approach. He believes bins were mixed together indiscriminately for blocks. The I-team dug deeper. The city tells us that on any given day, the contents of around three in 10 recycling bins in alleys like this one actually end up recycled. The rest go into landfills. It's a reality in line with national rates. It only takes a few re recycling containers to contaminate a load. That's terrible. I know. You can avoid some of the most common pitfalls. Here are the top things not to recycle. Plastic bags, styrofoam, food waste, and one-time use disposables like dirty paper plates. What you should recycle, paper, flattened cardboard, plastic bottles and containers, glass bottles and jars, metal cans, and food and drink cartons. <laughs> Turns out it's a pricey environmental effort. Roughly four times the cost of simply sending trash to the dumpster. Pizza contaminate. When it's done wrong, he says it means wasted effort and money down the drain. Yeah, but the only way that's going to change is, you know, to uh, educate the residents. The I-team discovered another challenge, a severe lack of workers. Right now, the city only has four full-time staff inspecting recycling bins. So Breitenfeld is working to hire more people. He also plans to increase the number of drop-off recycling locations. Right now we have approximately 30 
um, drop-off locations throughout the city. I'm looking to maybe get that up to 50 or double that. Our drop-off recycling sites, are they're, they get no contamination. People that want to recycle and do the right thing, they'll go there usually. These obstacles will not stop Mayor from continuing to sort. My parents talked about during World War II uh, recycling toothpaste tubes and things like that that were part of the effort. An effort he still believes is absolutely worth it. Big goals are achieved with a lot of little steps that people take and so all of us pitching in and doing our part to achieve we can achieve really big goals wherever you live here's the takeaway keep working to get the right things into those blue bins for the i team paula Vassan, five on your side you would like paula to answer your recycling questions or any i team investigation email her directly at p the letter p Vassan at ksdk.com if your eyes are going to be the, on, on the skies for Monday's partial eclipse, St. Louis has a few places to watch it. City Museum is hosting a rooftop watch party. There is limited access closer to the earth. Eckerd's is hosting their own, featuring live music and even a psychic. And the Science Center will live stream the eclipse from inside the planetarium. If you are attending any of the event, these events, be sure to snag some eclipse-friendly glasses for safe viewing. Let's check in once again with meteorologist, Chief Meteorologist Scott Connell. Another look at the Rutherford's forecast. And before we get to Monday, though, we have to get through this cold snap. Tonight. Yeah, we've got to get through the frosty night tonight. But I mean, we got to talk about the eclipse forecast, right? We all know. We all want to know exactly what's going to happen Monday. Cloud forecasting is always a challenge because, well, you know, it's hard enough for us to try to figure out the rain, let alone the cloud cover, that's even more of a challenge, but this is the good news. We're using PivotalWeather.com. That's a site that you too can go to, and we're looking at the eclipse path here of totality down to the southeast of St. Louis. Right now, the national blend of models indicating about a 26% chance or a 26% amount of cloud cover in Cape Girardeau, a 29% amount of cloud cover in Carbondale, and about 33% in Mount Vernon. Now, you're probably saying, well, that's a lot of cloud cover. We don't want that kind of cloud cover. That's pretty good. That's a mostly sunny sky, and we're thinking it's going to be high clouds, and here's why. On Sunday, we're tracking a system through the area. That will likely give us some showers and thunderstorms, especially Sunday morning, but it pushes off to the east of us by Monday morning. That leaves us Monday afternoon into early Monday evening with some high clouds streaming overhead. So that should still give us a pretty good view now as we're about three days out and our forecast really hasn't changed. Partly cloudy to mostly sunny through that time frame in southeast Missouri, southern Illinois. It will be warm. We'll be in the lower 70s when the eclipse starts. We may actually drop back into the 60s during the eclipse during totality as the winds kind of diminish a little bit and we see those temperatures back off and then we'll bounce back into the mid and upper 70s. Not the case tonight, though. Temperatures are in the mid 40s around St. Louis. We'll drop into the 30s tonight. Low to mid 30s as you go from St. Louis west and then upper 20s to around 30 farther to the east of St. Louis. That's why we have the freeze warning over on the Illinois side for early tomorrow morning. If you've got some tender plants, things out a little earlier maybe than what you traditionally would see, you might want to take a little extra precaution, cover them up tonight. 57 was our high today. We're doing better than that for tomorrow. There you go. Looking into tomorrow, we are going to start chilly, but this system is pushing eastbound and as it pushes eastbound, the next system comes in from the west. That means we're set for some pretty good weather here rolling into the weekend. Marlins versus cards got two day games here Saturday and Sunday, maybe a shower on Sunday. You got the Battle Hawks at the dome, which is climate controlled for your comfort and convenience, <laughs> yes. but City Park, not so much. So still a good evening there, and we will be talking about what we think is going to be a pretty nice day on Monday for our total solar eclipse before the rain chances return Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Continue to cross our fingers for yes. Monday. All right, thanks, Scott. Corey Miller is here with sports. It's a busy sports weekend, but I'll tell you what, the most star studded event was tonight out in Maryland Heights as a who's who of hockey legends and other notable figures took the ice to support a former Blues Enforcers fight. That's coming up next in sports.
This Five on Your Side Sports Report is sponsored by Telly Tire and Auto Centers, driving your way since 1942. Kelly Chase is one of the toughest we've ever seen in St. Louis sports. He has the scars from nearly 200 NHL fights to prove it. Now as he fights cancer, Chaser also wants to help others. And he enlisted an A-list group of friends to assist him in that mission tonight. It was Puck Cancer Night at Centene Community Ice Center. Chase, the Blues alumni and NHL alumni, came together to raise $600,000 for cancer research at Siteman Cancer Center. There you see the check. Listen to some of these names that showed up. Brett Hull, Dirks Bentley, Sean Payton, Chris Chelios, and Garth Brooks. It was a who's who of hockey greats and others all there to support Chase and his fight. He's pretty well connected and, uh, you know, the NHL alumni, when, when there's somebody in trouble and needs help, uh, we come a-calling, so this is a great event. Chaser, nobody can put a party on like Chaser can, and uh, just happy, I'm, I'm looking forward to the whole night. If you if you know Kelly Chase, if you've played with him, he starts talking about a fight, and a fight that he's going to win, you believe him. Women's Final Four, South Carolina beat NC State earlier. Sorry, Scott Connell. Then the big matchup tonight, Caitlin Clark in Iowa against Paige Beckers in UConn for a trip to the title game. There's Edwardsville's Kate Martin, early triple to set the tone. Clark had a slow start, but turned it on in the second half. Look at this insane four-point play. Right now, Iowa has a slim lead in the fourth quarter. We have a big women's college hoops game in our town tomorrow as well. The SLU women will play Minnesota at SIUE for the WNIT championship. It has really been an insane run for the Billikens. They've won 10 of their last 11 games, and Coach Tillett has this bunch believing they can finish the year with a trophy. There was so much adversity that we faced, and, and much that people wouldn't know, right? Things that we have to learn as a group. And so to see the lessons being learned and being applied, even to the point that each game is like, that's why we had to learn that lesson. And that seems to have happened to us each game of the WNIT. The Cardinals didn't play today, but opening day sure left us with plenty to talk about. After the pageantry, which new Cardinal Kyle Gibson got a pretty good seat for, the team pulled off a rally to get back to 500 on the season. Right in the middle of yesterday's action was this guy. It was Mason Wynn's first opening day in St. Louis, and he made some memories. Wynn went two for four with an exhilarating triple that was part of that seventh inning surge. Wynn raced his average to 350 on the season and definitely felt that opening day energy. Nah, I felt just electrified, man. I was, I was, you know, looked at the dugout, everybody was going crazy. Looked at the fans going crazy, man. It was, it was a lot of fun. Like, I, I was cold at the beginning of the game. At that point, I mean, I was so fired up, man. I couldn't even, couldn't even feel the weather. Did you have it in your mind to go home at any point? Oh, yeah, 100%. If Pop, would, if Pop was waving me, I was going. I was ready for it, but he put up the stop sign, so. Of course, opening day is about more than just the game. Who doesn't get chills seeing the Clydesdales and Hall of Famers going around the track? We caught up with some of those legends yesterday and asked them what it truly means to be a Cardinal. And now you've got the birds, for instance, on your chest. You understand what that means from Ducky Medwick to Mutual to, you know, start naming the names and you feel like you've joined that and you belong as part of that. And now you kind of live and feel like that. So it's a, it's kind of like, a, it's, it's like a credential or it's like a confirmation. It says, yeah, you've come all this way. Um, you've earned this and you deserve this. Look at this schedule for tomorrow. Cardinals, Slew Women, Battle Hawks, and City SC all in action in town tomorrow. Going to be a crazy day, of course. We're going to have it all covered for you right here on Five on Your Side. And I know you will. Oh, wow, yeah. tomorrow's going to be crazy. <laughs> all right, thanks, Corey. Well, the zoo's welcoming back some old friends when you can get up close and personal with these Caribbean Cove carnivores. Some seaside friends are back at the St. Louis Zoo's Caribbean Cove. Guests can now watch, touch, and even feed stingrays and sharks as they glide through their 17,000-gallon saltwater pool. Tickets are $4.95 per person, and you can catch these sea critters from now until November 10th. <laughs> All right, final look at the forecast. Yeah, cold tonight. Not exactly your, you know, saltwater fun excitement <laughs> for the old sharks. But tomorrow morning we get a little frost, a little freeze, 
after that, we're much warmer heading into next week. Shower chance on Sunday and then more unsettled weather Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Still looking good for the eclipse at this point. That is good news. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon is next. Be sure to start your morning tomorrow with today in St. Louis at 6 a.m.